welcome to She Plays Weekly, the only sports show where men's basketball is an afterthought. Let's get into what's happening in women's sports this week. Soccer fans are finally getting their fix this weekend, with the U.S. women's national team back in action with games against Sweden and France and the 2021 Challenge Cup kicking off on Friday. The first edition of the Cup was a solution to COVID shutdowns, but now the league is trying to make it a tradition. The Houston Dash will defend their title after a Cinderella run last year, but that's not the only thing they'll be defending. Paige Beckers was named AP Player of the Year this week, making her the first freshman ever to receive the honor. Beckers is an absurdly good player, and she deserves the hype she's been getting, but women's basketball seems to be attached to this narrative that there can only be one great player per season. Luckily, this week also gave us the unbelievable rise of Arizona's Ari McDonald, who beat Beckers' UConn team in the Final Four and showed us how much fun basketball can be when we get to know multiple players' stories. She also showed us that if you're in her way, you'd better move. This girl is five foot six, but she will walk right through you. World number one, Ashley Barty, won the women's singles category in the Miami Open on Saturday, taking home a prize of over $300,000. That's a dramatically reduced amount from prior years due to cutbacks caused by the pandemic, but it is, get this, the same amount of prize money given to the winner of the men's category. That feels so strange to say. I'm so used to talking about millions and millions of dollars in unequal pay, but this is just so delightfully boring. Athlete Ally released its new Athletic Equality Index on Monday, ranking NCAA D1 athletic departments on LGBTQ plus inclusion. It gives schools a score from 0 to 100 to determine how well they support LGBTQ athletes based on things like non-discrimination policies and partnership with LGBTQ advocacy groups. The index sets a really high standard, and only 10 programs currently score at 100%. In related March Madness news, if we're going on LGBTQ inclusion, Arizona comes out on top, while the men's championship game is a real race to the bottom. Both the Orlando Pride and the Houston Dash dropped new space-themed kits this week. The Pride actually sent a jersey into space, while the Dash gave their first jersey to, an, to a NASA Chief of Exploration Mission Planning. I don't know where the sudden NWSL space fever came from, and I don't want to play favorites, but I do insist that all Pride Dash mashups from now on be referred to exclusively as the space race. Sky Blue FC looked like it might be joining the space theme too for a minute, but instead they surprised everyone when they rebranded to Gotham FC on Tuesday. So I guess the question of the Challenge Cup will now be, who wins in a fight, space or Batman? Now that the NCAA tournament is over, players are starting to declare for the WNBA draft. This is obviously great, and hopefully the huge success of the tournament will translate to new fans for the WNBA. The only problem is that the WNBA still only has 12 teams. That's 144 roster spots, and with more than 50 players already declared for this year, there will be a lot of talent left on the table. The WNBA needs expansion. You've got to make room for all these great players before they leave for another league. One that apparently has room for everybody. We've got a great show for you tonight. Sam Fisher of Athletes Unlimited Softball is here. Plus, we'll call out some of the nonsense that went down in sports this week. But before we get to all that, WNBA star Alicia Clark will be sitting out the 2021 WNBA season after she picked up a foot injury while playing overseas in Lyon. She is far from the first player to lose WNBA playing time due to overseas contracts, as the competitive salaries available in other countries regularly draw players into a cycle of year-round play. For more on that, let's take a deep dive. Forward Alicia Clark was set to make a huge impact this season. After winning her second WNBA championship with the Seattle Storm in 2020, she made the move to the Washington Mystics in a huge free agency signing. Clark's arrival was supposed to help the Mystics return to the top of the league after their 2019 title win was followed by disappointment when several of their top players opted out of last year's bubble season. Her skill as a stopper led her to two all-defensive team selections, and she was expected to be an instant starter for her new team. Now the Mystics will have to rethink their game plan, as Clark will ride the bench this year after she got a foot injury playing in France during the WNBA offseason. Clark is far from alone in playing overseas. WNBA players have been making the trip to Europe, China, and Russia for years to supplement playing time and income. In 2018, more than two-thirds of WNBA athletes also played overseas, and not just the lesser-known players. Among the big names playing abroad this year are Kia Vaughn, Courtney Vandersloot, Brianna Stewart, and Satu Savali. Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi famously played for long stints in Russia during past off-seasons. 
Name any famous WNBA player and you can bet they've probably spent at least a little time playing elsewhere. The reason for the huge proportion of WNBA players making the trip every year is simple. They have to make a living. The WNBA is one of the most competitive jobs out there with an extremely uncompetitive salary. The average salary for a WNBA player in 2020 was a bit over $100,000. The average NBA salary in 2020, 10 million. There's no world in which that kind of disparity makes sense, but here we are. These players have families and they can't support themselves on their league salaries alone, and so they go. A top WNBA athlete playing overseas can make at least three times her WNBA salary. Elite players have made up to a million dollars per season playing abroad, and when you're from a country where women in sports are criminally undervalued, that kind of money and respect is hard to pass up. Diana Taurasi famously sat out the 2015 WNBA season because her Russian team, who was paying her $1.5 million, by the way, wanted her to rest her body. That team understood what is becoming clearer every year in the WNBA. This type of year-round play is unsustainable. The WNBA and international seasons run right up against each other. There have been times when the WNBA preseason has begun with some players still thousands of miles away. These athletes truly have no off-season, and that's way too hard on the body. When elite athletes push themselves and don't take the time to rest, injuries are going to happen. The human body can't keep up that kind of intensity forever. No matter how superhuman these players might seem, injuries will always catch up with them. Some of the biggest players in the WNBA have missed seasons due to injuries they picked up playing abroad. Chine Ogwamike and Brianna Stewart were two of the most famous incidents, but it's incredibly common. The worst part is that it always seems to happen when a player is right on the brink of something great. Who knows what amazing basketball we've missed out on because these players didn't get the rest they needed to perform at the highest level. The fact that WNBA players have to spend half the year in another country in order to support themselves speak to the speaks to the ridiculous disparity between men's and women's basketball, but it also proves how committed they are to the WNBA. The players keep coming back to the league, not because it's paying them well, but because they believe in it. And the athletes are doing the work to build the league into something truly sustainable. The 2020 CBA negotiations were headed by NECA Ogwamike, and because of that, WNBA players are being paid more than ever before. The league is moving in the right direction, but slowly, and in the meantime, players are getting hurt and burning out. We'll know the league is truly sustainable when its players are finally able to take their off-season, to rest and spend time with family instead of jetting off to the other side of the world. The off-time is where so many opportunities are born for the men, and I'm certain that when these women have the time and space a true off-season provides, they will do amazing things with it. That was your deep dive. We'll be right back with Sam Fisher. Our guest tonight is an All-American, a two-time gold medal winner at the Softball World Cup, and a competitor in Athletes Unlimited's first ever softball season last summer. Sam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So you, like I said, you just played in Athletes Unlimited very first season. They've yeah. got other sports going now, but you guys were the, the OG. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about that experience, what that whole thing was like? Oh yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of like you, you looked at it and you're like, is it reinventing the wheel? And then you get there and you're like, no, the wheel's the same. It's just uh, more sparkly, you know, like it was just, just everything about it was so focused on have like giving us a professional experience uh, as professional athletes while also giving the fans an incredibly interactive experience and, and getting, getting the sport into people's living rooms, you know, getting to be on TV, getting to, have the whole experience that you would think of as a professional athlete. So it just, I mean, it was, it was really, it was top notch. Yeah. And it, it reminds me a lot of fantasy sports. I hear that said mm -hmm. a lot. Did you guys like feel that when you were playing, did you start to feel like, like a video game character a little bit? <laughs> so sometimes like when I would rewatch the games, if I like got a single, like 10 points, that's like what you say <laughs> when you're, you know, at practice and you try to like make a ball in the bucket and you're like, okay, 10 points for me. But it did kind of feel cool where you're like, oh my God, all right, team, we're, we're fighting for 60 points. Let's do it. You know? So it, it did, but it also felt like the same game, the same competitive high intensity game, which I loved that piece that it, it stayed the same while also evolving. Yeah, I think definitely a piece that people, and myself, when I first started looking into all this, but also everyone I've talked to who I've tried to explain it to, which is always <laughs> like a little bit of a process, the thing that comes up is like, what is it like not having teams and not having real coaches? Like, I think there's this idea that 
because there's no teams, no coaches, it would create this really like fighty individualistic environment, but Mm -hmm. that's not what I've seen at all. I feel like you guys are all acting like a team. It's just a different team every week. Can you talk to that at all? Yeah, totally. In this pro softball world, everybody knows everybody. So that piece I think is really um, influential in the whole, we don't have teams because every week you're kind of playing with people who you know anyway. So I think that part helps, but also we had three days of practice before games and you look at it and you think three days, that's it. How can you build chemistry and camaraderie, those things, but it, it happened immediately. I mean, we did team, team building stuff. We, you know, we did talks, we did everything that you would think that a team would do given a certain amount of time being a traditional team, but we did it in three days. So it was just, it was just a little, um, you know, accelerated, but we managed to treat each week individually. Like this is the team that I want to win with. And then the next week, now this is the team. I wanna win with. So it was interesting, but it, honestly, for me, I don't think it really took much time to adjust to. It was just really exciting to play with these incredible women. It's definitely exciting. And there's like a whole other element to it with all the drafts that you never, like, I never thought about that before. And now I'm watching and I'm like, oh, are these two players, like, are they going to pick each other next week? Like, are we making alliances? Like, it's really a cool system. Are you planning on coming back this year? Do you know yet? So un- unfortunately with the, the Japanese season, it, it conflicts directly with the Athletes Unlimited season. So I won't be uh, continuing for season two, which has nothing to do with Athletes Unlimited. It's just the opportunity to play in Japan right now is um, financially, it, it, it's just a better position for me. Um, you get to go to Japan. You can't. And we get, you know, living in Japan does have its perks, but this, <laughs> it was interesting because saying yes to Japan it was exciting, but it also was, it hurt me because it means I had to say no to Athletes Unlimited. So it was one of those situations where I was like, oh my God, I want this so bad, but I don't want to leave this. So yeah, so yeah, this year. Yeah. What, I mean, the league, I feel like is doing so much great work. They're really out there. They're mm-hmm. advertising really well. I mean, I'm like super women, like the Google who is watching me or whatever is like they know that I love women's sports. So I get all those ads, but I feel like they're really doing a good job with that. Um, what are your hopes for like, where do you want to see that league go in the future? What would you like to see change? Oh, I, it's it's so great because season one set the bar so unbelievably high. We had meetings. I was on the player executive committee for, for Athletes Unlimited and we had meetings after the season of like, okay, where can we improve? And the five of us on, on the, on the committee were like, you know, it was, it was, how, how can we improve on that? You know, like it was so great that we are struggling to find things that could be better, but, but obviously you think financially, you want to be able to just focus on your sport and not have to get another job out of season. You know, I'd like to think that one day, if I have a daughter who wants to play sports and can play at their professional level, that she gets that opportunity to, to just be a pro athlete and make good money, you know, but for where it started, I think the, the, the opportunities are limitless for what they've started to do. And the, like you said, the way that they've marketed, the way that they've advertised, getting it in front of people who don't normally have women's sports in front of them. It's, it's just, you know, it's limitless. Yeah, absolutely. And they're already moving into two other sports. Um, did you get to watch volleyball at all? Oh my God, yes. It, I, I still am like, how do they do that? It was, it was so fascinating and amazing. I had so much fun watching. It's so fun. I'm a volleyball player and a coach. So okay. I was just like dialed in that whole time. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, it's so fun. And like- Unbelievable. They're crazy good. And they're Minnesota alums there. I'm from Minnesota. So I was okay. just like, cheering so hard for- <laughs> great that's so great oh so much fun um so you also have a podcast uh called the unknown pro can you tell me about that a little bit i love talking so i was like how can i channel this love into something productive and um it was something that i had thought about for a while because i've met so many amazing women and who have so many great stories and in softball you really don't hear everyone's story you hear you know a couple of main ones and then there's all these other women doing so many great things so it was kind of like for me I wanted to know more about the the you know the athletes that I was competing with and against but I also wanted to to hopefully give an opportunity to share that story with others so that's kind of where the inspiration came from and man it's been it's been really fun because it's like this you just get to chat you get to chat 
ask questions that you might have always wanted to ask. And, and it's been, it's been a really cool experience. Yeah, people don't know this, but this is really just a secret ploy for me to make new friends. I love that. I love that. No other reason. Don't <laughs> want women's sports visibility. What is it? We don't know her. Um, so last question. I was not a person who watched softball until Athletes Unlimited. Like that really got me into it, which mm -hmm. is awesome. But um, I'm just wondering for other people who don't watch softball, who maybe haven't got into it yet, why should they start? Like, what is it about your sport that gets you excited that you think other people should know about? Man, in general, sports is like you've got the any given day rule, right? Any any given any team can beat any team on any given day. So that's exciting in itself. But for softball, it's so fast paced, it's so intense that you're 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 you have to be glued. You know, it's one of those things where you, you can't you can't be uninvested because the game is so intense and so fast. And and you see some like the pitchers. Oh my gosh, they they're like. The stuff that they're they monsters it's great it's here you're right it's terrifying so you know just the level of competitiveness especially with you know getting to the pro game to the pro level is it's so intense every second and i think that's huge um and i love i'm a huge baseball fan so if you you know if you already kind of like baseball it's just baseball that it's accelerated you know and that so it's you know it's just man i have so many good things to say about it obviously because it's my life yeah, but well. um but yeah, it's just an intense, challenging sport and so many things can happen all the time. And I just, I, I love that. All right. Well, I mean, you heard her. Go watch softball if you haven't yet. You need to, I promise. Athletes Unlimited is amazing and softball yeah. in general is amazing. And I'm getting more into it by the day. So it's great. It. Um, all right. Well, we'll be right back with more from Sam Fisher a little bit later in the show, but uh, we'll talk about her time in Japan and we'll play a game that is all about speed. So stick around. <laughs> Sometimes you get a week in women's sports where people are feeling extra rowdy. When that happens, the refs have to step in and settle things down. Let's take a look at some folks who acted out this week in a segment we call Foul Trouble. All right, so we have quite a few troublemakers on our hands this week, but let's start with our more literal foul issues. The NCAA tournament refs were a constant source of pain to basketball lovers over the past week, and we just need to take a moment to call out a couple of the worst calls from the final rounds. First up, this controversial no-call in the UConn-Baylor game during the Elite Eight. Look, we can get into a conversation about how tightly the rest of the game was called, but you can't look at this picture and try to tell me that's not several pairs of hands directly in her face. Another wild call came in the final four matchup between UConn and Arizona, when a phantom call on Christine Williams caused her to foul out. Where is the contact? Did she foul a ghost? Did she bump into the air a little too hard? And finally, this little love tap by Cameron Brinks in the Stanford-South Carolina Final Four game. If you can't call that push, you may be in the wrong sport. Maybe try something a little more violent by design. These refs were working hard, but some of these calls did not work for us, so we're going to have to call a foul. <whistles> Next up, we have our new favorite villain, the NCAA. We talked a ton about the disparities between the men's and women's tournaments last week, but it turns out that, shocker, the shenanigans don't stop there. Forbes reported this week that the NCAA's claims about the women's tournament losing money are even less valid than we thought. The women's tournament had incredible viewership and engagement numbers, with the national championship game peaking at 5.4 million viewers and social media engagement doubling the comparable men's games throughout the Final Four. The numbers coming out of the women's tournament all point in one direction. This is a product people want to watch. So why does the NCAA claim it can't make them money? The NCAA sells the men's and women's tournaments completely differently. The men's side is sold as its own product for around $771 million annually. The women's TV rights, on the other hand, are sold as part of a larger package, lumped in with 24 other NCAA championships. According to Sportico, if the women's tournament was sold alone like the men's, it could easily bring in triple what it currently does. But that would take away the NCAA's excuse for open discrimination, wouldn't it? It's not a bad product, it's bad business, and the NCAA isn't fooling anyone with their whining, so we're gonna have to call a foul. <whistles> and finally, Draymond Green. Where do I even start? We left him alone last week when he tried to come at female athletes in what can only loosely be described as a Twitter thread to tell them that the reason they don't have pay equity is that they aren't getting their stories told. But this week he decided to dig himself an even deeper hole when he came for the WNBA players, saying, 
quote, I'm really tired of seeing them complain about lack of pay because they are doing themselves a disservice by just complaining. This man thinks he can tell the WNBA how to get something done. They got a whole senator elected this year. The players in the WNBA are the gold standard of athlete activism. You are just a very tall man who can't figure out when to stop talking and start listening. You're telling women to speak up, to ask for the money they deserve, but you're ignoring the fact that it's painfully easy for people in power to ignore these women. If you really want to help, you say something. You are an incredibly powerful figure in the basketball world. How about instead of complaining, you put your money where your mouth is and see what you can do for women's sports. Draymond Green, your heart might be in the right place, but you're scolding the wrong people. Until you can realize that the call is coming from inside the house, we're going to have to call a foul. That was foul trouble. We will be right back with more from Sam Fisher. All right, we're back with Sam Fisher. So you were talking a little bit about how you play for the Japanese Professional League. Could you talk a little bit about that? That sounds amazing. Yes, I would love to. I'm going to try to keep it short because I could talk about it for like a day and a half. I but I mean, I, I played two seasons over there in 2018, 2019. I'm actually supposed to go back this year, but with COVID, um, it's been hard to get a visa. So I'm, I'm still in America, but the experience, it, every, every level after college has been different, like a different level of competitiveness and, and the competition has been a little bit different, but they are so intense over there. And it just kind of made me realize like, I have to step my game up if I, if I'm going to be successful over here, because they're so, they practice eight hours a day. Like the, even our coaches are like, don't try to keep up with the Japanese girls because you will not, you know, like, it's not going to happen, you know? So they a are, they, battle. Are, yeah. Yeah, they just, they work so hard and they are constantly practicing and they are so good. So softball wise, it, it really made, made me, you know, step my game up and, and learn how to practice better in order to succeed over there. But um, off the field, I mean, the, the country is incredible. The, you know, I, I'm fortunate to play with one of my really good friends over there, Jordan Taylor, and we've, we've been able to travel the country and do different things. You know, we got tattoos together over there. Like, it's just the whole Classic. experience. Yeah, you gotta, you know. Yeah, so, you're there. Uh. Mine as well. So, um, so, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's been an unbelievable experience, and I really feel lucky to have the opportunity because at any given time, there's only, like, eight to 10 Americans over there at once for, for a season. So having the opportunity, I feel very lucky, very blessed. Um, and it just, it's, it's been an experience of a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. What is your, just quickly, like, what is your day-to-day -day life like over there? Like what's, what's super different from here? Super. It, it's, it's, it's the full-time job aspect, you know, in, in, in the States, you know, you have where you might work out and then you might go give lessons and you might go practice on your own. And it's kind of scattered because you're trying to make money and, and still stay in shape. But in Japan, I wake up, I have my morning routine. I have my breakfast, uh, maybe do a little laundry, whatever. Cause you have to do laundry more often over there. Cause the machines are this big. Um, but then I go to practice and I might practice all day as if someone's at a job, you know, all day. Because you so, are exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's like I go to I go to work and then we come home, have dinner together as a team, and then it's six o'clock and I have the rest of the evening to myself. So it's essentially like a nine to five job just on the field. That is truly the dream. You're making a lot of athletes in America jealous right now, female <laughs> athletes only. Right. Let's be clear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> great. Great. Um, yes. so all right, well, we just met each other. We're friends, obviously now, but yes. um friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I would like to get, you know, get to know you a little bit better. So to do that, we're going to play a game right now that we call rapid fire. I'm so excited. All right. So this is a super simple game. Very easy. Um, we've heard a lot about softball, but we want to hear a little bit more about like the person side. Tell me more about Sam. We want to get to know you. So uh, we're on limited time though, obviously. So we're just going to Give you a bunch of questions i've got a bunch of them right here listed and we're gonna see how many you can get through in a minute Whew. no pressure lots Let's of pressure it. but it's okay <laughs> these are kind of all over the place so you know do your best it'll be okay. a great time. all right sound good sounds great all right i am putting one minute on the clock here we go okay all right what was the last song you listened to oh my god uh, anyone by justin bieber <laughs> nice on a scale of one to ten how good of a driver are you Nine and a half. What? Uh, what do you want to accomplish before you retire? 
Uh, play play Athletes Unlimited again and Japan again. Amazing. Uh, who is your favorite opponent? Kelly Crutchman. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you sneeze yesterday? Probably like six. Average. How many cups of coffee do you drink a day? Bagel. I don't like coffee. <sighs> um, that's offensive to me. You Sorry. are about to get in a fight. What song comes on? Rocky Like a Hurricane by the Scorpions. Amazing. What is your signature dance move? It's, um, I, I just like move my shoulders and nothing else. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite holiday? Christmas. If you were a muffin, what flavor would you be? Blueberry. Last show I you know. benched? Oh my God, um, Shit's Creek. Would you rather have a dog tail or a rabbit nose? Rabbit nose. That's a minute. <laughs> oh, those were all over the place. They are, that's the fun part. That I'm was well. That I'm was pretty sweating. good. I feel like we're going to have like a running competition here. You're only our second guest. This is our second episode, but yeah. So this is a big deal. Don't worry about it. I'm extremely competitive. So if somebody gets 13, I want to come back on the show. Absolutely. I think we started a leaderboard from here on out, but you are number one until we play this game again. So for me, I'm good with that. Just enjoy that for as long as you possibly can. But that was pretty good. I'm impressed. All right. Well, this was amazing. It's so good to meet you. Um, that's all we have with Sam tonight, but you can check out her podcast. Uh, it's called the unknown pro it's on Spotify and iTunes mm -hmm. and keep an eye out for her in Japan professional league and maybe in athletes unlimited again, one day, we hope, we hope, um, we've got one more thing for you though, before you go. So stick around. Men's sports have a lot of things, money, media coverage, money, but one thing they don't have is athletes who can grow a human being inside their body and then get right back in the game. The moms of sports are literal superheroes and we want to take every chance to cheer them on. So let's bow down for a moment in a segment we call Super Moms. This week we want to highlight Arizona's Adia Barnes. Throughout the NCAA tournament, Barnes balanced her roles as mom and coach like a total expert. In her very first NCAA tournament, Barnes led her Wildcats all the way to the final. The Wildcats came onto the scene as outsiders, but Adia Barnes and senior Ari McDonald soon made a name for themselves as they blazed through the tournament, upsetting Texas A&M in the Sweet 16 and UConn in the Final Four. And Barnes did all of this with a baby on her hip. This was even more impressive because the NCAA's policy regarding children did not make things easy for Barnes. They were allowed in the bubble, but counted against a team's 34-person party limit, so working mothers had to choose between extra staff and their kid. As a breastfeeding mother, Barnes didn't really have a choice. Capri was born in September, right when the season started, and Adia Barnes only took a week off. She was on Zoom calls four days after she had a C-section. Four days. Barnes talks about her team like a family, explaining how their support and encouragement helped her come back so quickly. Arizona fell to Stanford in the final, but Barnes spoke afterwards of the new bar she felt she set for the future by making it this bar. During the interview, her crying baby in the background brought a smile to her face. Adia Barnes took complete charge of this tournament, representing coaches, working mothers, and black women. She was one of two black women coaching in the Final Four, and her reaction to Arizona's historic Final Four win put her into the spotlight on Friday night. She used profanity and put up her middle fingers in celebration with her team, and didn't apologize for it when people started trying to shame her. In the moment, she said what she felt, and because it was an intimate moment with her team, Barnes thought apologies were unnecessary. And she's right. Women are always expected to make apologies for actions deemed inappropriate or unladylike. If it were a male coach on a men's team, I'm not sure we would have even thought twice about it. Men's coaches are allowed to be loud, animated, angry, which is why we love Adia Barnes that much more. She is just herself, and she perfectly emulates the representation we need in women's sports. Can we just normalize it already? It's fun to watch people get excited. Give me more screaming and huddles. It makes me like you more, and it lets me know not to cross you. Women are athletes, women are coaches, women are moms, women are loud, and women can be angry. Women make it all the way to the national championship game and pump breast milk at halftime. If I learned anything from the tournament this year, it's that I want to be like Adia Barnes when I grow up. That's our show, everybody. Thanks so much for watching She Plays Weekly. We'll see you next week.